Thank you very much for the opportunity to present some of our work here. This is going to be a very different talk from what you just heard. Uh, but I'm actually going to stick to the spirit of dynamical systems. Um, in fact, so much so that I'm going to start by giving inspiration where most of the inspiration for the work behind genetic conflict comes from, which actually comes from the fictional character, the Red Queen, who was introduced to us in the Alice in Wonderland books by Lewis Carroll. And there's a very famous line in the book where after Alice has been introduced to the wonders of Wonderland, and she's been walking with the Red Queen for a long time, she starts complaining, we've been walking for a long time, but we don't seem to be going anywhere. And in response, the Red Queen says that now here in Wonderland, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you actually want to get somewhere, you have to run at twice the speed. Now, in the context of the line, this is, of course, just another example of how weird Wonderland really is. But this was actually seized upon as a very important theorem in evolutionary biology by Lee Van Valen and his colleagues, who really sort of thought of this as the second incarnation of Darwinian thinking in evolutionary biology. Whereas Darwin had been primarily uh, interested in how organisms adapt to their abiotic natural environments, uh, Lee Van Valen and his peers recognized that a large part of that environment is actually made of competing species. So for example, here, um, in the case of snow leopards, uh, you can actually make very precise predictions about what would happen to the population of snow leopards based on what happened to the population of snow hares, their prey, in previous generations. And they go back and forth in these beautiful cyclical episodes of boom and bust cycles. So what my lab is very interested in is taking this uh, insight from ecological evolution and applying it um, in molecular biology terms, sort of asking the question, can we use arms races as a signature to drive rapid evolution and use these uh, signatures of rapid evolution to decipher the arms races. So it's a very easy leap to go from prey-predator interactions to the interactions between antiviral proteins and, and viral proteins, which are basically uh, exposed to the cell when the virus enters the cell. Um, in this high-resolution uh, protein structure here, small joke, um, you can see that this antiviral uh, protein is recognizing some feature of the viral protein, and by doing so, is going to exert its antiviral action and extinguish the virus before it has a chance to continue uh, with the rest of its life cycle. In response, this puts a lot of Darwinian pressure on the viral population to explore new states such that they are no longer subject to antagonism by the existing version of the antiviral protein. This puts pressure back onto the host to reestablish its dominance by evolving new states such can recognize the new version of the viral protein. So what we've just witnessed is one sort of two-step dance between the virus and the antiviral proteins. If this was the adaptive immune system, your T cells and your antibodies, this would actually happen on the, in the matter of days. And this would be very important to keep pace with the changing viruses, which is one of the reasons why we're having this sort of delayed celebration uh, this year. But it's also sort of, my lab is actually very interested in parts of the um, immune system that don't evolve that dynamically. They're actually encoded or hardwired by the genome. And these are the innate immune genes that are hardwired. And you might consider that viruses have orders of magnitude uh, advantages over innate immune systems simply because of their faster evolution um, and more rapid um, uh, and of bigger population sizes. But actually, antiviral proteins have many tricks up their sleeves, and those are the tricks we'd like to uncover, including the fact that there's just not one antiviral protein interceding with the virus, but there's literally uh, 200 proteins that are turned on when your body senses that it's under attack, and fever, for example, is another one of those responses. From the perspective of this arms race, though, what is cool from the evolutionary sense is this is a relentless engine for forward evolution. And what drives this engine is the fact that one party is always in the losing side. Either the virus or the host has something to gain by adaptation. And so what is nice about this is that by recognizing the features of that adaptation or that innovation trapped in the sequences of these viruses or trapped in the sequences of the innate immune genes, we can actually completely reconstruct these arms races as they occurred over millennia. In many cases, we can do so even though there are no active remnants of the viruses remaining. They only are fossilized versions that sit in our genome, and we can use sort of reconstructions of these fossilized versions to again reconstruct what these arms races look like. 
what does this look like on a genome-wide level? But for, on a genome-wide level, we can sort of quantify this innovation quite beautifully in protein coding genes by uh, identifying a metric or sort of a speed limit that is imposed by mutation. This is the so-called DNDS signature, which uh, looks at mutations that alter amino acids versus those that don't. And the dotted line is roughly the speed limit. You can see that most protein coding genes are far below the speed limit, and that's the natural selection role to prevent these genes from acquiring mutations willy-nilly because most of those mutations are likely to be deleterious for function and would be basically removed or constantly purged uh, by negative selection. But my lab is actually very interested in the genes that are scofflaws, that are fa evolving much faster than the speed limit. And that, again, is a signature that is imposed by natural selection because this rapid evolution is actually beneficial particularly in the categories of genes that occur, and innate immune genes are heavily overrepresented in this category. Just to give you an example of this, we could also imagine that this insight doesn't just identify the genes that are under rapid evolution, but even if you look at this uh, arms race for binding affinity between the innate immune gene on one side and the uh, viral protein on the other side, you can see that we do not expect this signature of rapid evolution to be randomly distributed over the proteins. We actually expect it to be concentrated on those residues that maximally affect this binding affinity. So we can use evolutionary biology to actually tell us about specificity domains of the biochemistry of this interaction. And this has turned out since we first proposed this, um, uh, me and my colleague Michael Emmerman in a paper in PNAS many years ago, this has actually turned out to be almost uh, a rule in terms of identifying specificity city domains. It actually also tells us something really important about susceptibility determinants, because we used to think that the reason one species gets uh, affected by a pathogenic virus versus a, a neighboring species does not was because our genome repertoires were totally different. That turns out not to be true. In fact, our genome repertoires are very similar, but the specificity tuning of each of these uh, immune genes is quite different because of their own private history of interactions with pathogenic viruses. And what's really cool here is we can actually swap in this uh, historical record and improve human immunity. Just to give you an idea of that, here's an example of a, a protein called TRIM5-alpha, which is discovered by Joseph Zadrowski's lab, which intercedes with an incoming HIV-1 capsid when it enters the genome and actually prevents it from going through the rest of its uh, life cycle. The rhesus macaque version of TRIM5-alpha is so effective that you can inject rhesus macaques with HIV-1, and they will basically purge the infection. The human version is not rapid enough or avid enough to bind the incoming HIV capsid, which is why we do not have biological protection uh, because of this. So going back to this arms race scenario, we focused on where is the most rapid evolution occurring in TRIM5-alpha, and actually it turns out all of the rapid evolution is focused on one very small loop called the variable one loop for obvious reasons, because this is the most rapidly evolving. And you can see that even in laboratory experiments, the human TRIM5 version actually only provides two-fold restriction, whereas the rhesus version provides 100-fold restriction. Now, we decided that what if we would simply swap in this rapidly evolving segment, and when we did so, we basically recovered almost complete rhesus-like protection. And even more remarkably, just one residue of these was sufficient to provide meaningful protection. Um, uh, in the previously uh, incapable human trim 5 backbone. What's really interesting as a side note is that many groups actually converged on exactly the same loop, um, but we actually made the fewest amount of combinations because we were uh, motivated primarily by where the most rapid evolution had occurred rather than something intrinsic about the biochemistry. So there's a beautiful complementarity between the two approaches. What's also nice about this is that we can not only use this historical record to reconstruct what the specificity domains are, but now you take a page out of natural selection and actually convert this into um, a mechanism to decipher novel antivirals in the lab. So essentially use combinatorial mutagenesis on exactly the same residues that have rapidly evolved in the course of evolution to ask, can we now make super restrictor versions? Because God knows we could use uh, versions of those that would prevent a, a further infections against pathogenic viruses. So here's another proof of principle with another antiviral protein called MXA, where we did exactly that, where we identified just five rapidly evolving residues, uh, and we combinatorially mutagenized all of them. And when we did so, you can actually see that wild-type MXA, which is the best wild uh, restrictor on the uh, left-hand side of this graph, 
is a pretty good protection, uh, but it, it's nothing compared to the protection you get from a super restrictor that is only different in three amino acid positions out of 600 amino acid. So what that tells us is natural selection has not just told us what we can do, but exactly how we can manipulate them to get much better and more effective antivirals. I'm sort of going to return to this speed limit graph here because I've been telling you only about immunity because it makes perfect sense. But our eye is also drawn to categories of genes that actually make no sense that they belong in this rapidly evolving class, including genes that are completely essential for many uh, biological processes, including essential processes like cell division. And to address this question, we've moved away from the more charismatic primates, but also actually uh, taken advantage of many different models um, in the lab, but primarily uh, focusing on Drosophila, which is sort of the model of organism of choice in my lab. So the way to sort of think about this is we have grown up with the perspective of the cell of this beautiful, intricate, uh, interlocking gears and, and, and knobs, almost like a Swiss watch when you look at its inner workings. But in a sense, the Swiss watch also sort of reflects uh, a, a sense of status, uh, static design, right? Because any kind of manipulation on one uh, component is likely to need severe accommodation by other components. So we really expect this kind of design of an engineering design to be pretty static. But instead, the evolutionary approach is actually telling us that there's all kinds of prey-predator interactions going on within the genome, and somehow the cell has survived in spite of accommodating all of these rogue elements uh, within the genome. A really good example of the rogue element are the uh, jumping genes that jump around a genome, which are the kinds of genes that both Sue Wessler and my lab also study. Um, but in particular, we are interested in why cell division? I mean, after all, this is one of the most fundamental processes where chromosomes come together in this orchestrated way and um, ensure that both daughter cells ensure exa inherit exactly the same number of chromosomes. This process is so important. We go through millions of these uh, cell divisions in our body every day, and it's really important they all be policed well, because otherwise that can be a very deleterious outcome. And yet the underlying DNA and proteins that mediate these processes are actually the most rapidly evolving, almost as rapidly evolving as immune genes. So we've actually sort of taken a, a, a brief survey about the types of things that could lead to this rapid evolution. So, you know, if you think about the types of cell division that occur, many of you are actually thinking about the process I just showed you where a mother cell divides to give rise to two daughter cells that are genetic twins of each other. And for the longest time, we thought there's absolutely no prospects for an evolutionarily interesting thing going on, although this is cell biologically very interesting until we realize that there's actually other things that are also dividing here, including cytoplasmic elements like mitochondrial DNA, but also the discovery of extra chromosomal plasmids that are basically differentially inherited. And it's actually the conflict between them and the rest of the genome that can drive a lot of innovation, but not in cell division proteins. So our, our search continues. We went to male meiosis, the process that produces pollen in plants and sperm in animals, or spores and fungi. And in male meiosis, there's actually lots of opportunities for conflict because the end products are not genetically identical. They're different combinations of mom's and dad's chromosomes, red chromosomes, and purple chromosomes. And in fact, even though it seems uh, kind of counterintuitive, there's a huge uh, advantage to being selfish in this process. So the red chromosome that can encode a toxin that prevents the maturation of the purple chromosome bearing sperm. So even though this male had two types of genes, only one type of gene gets transmitted to the next generation, which is a huge selfish advantage to the red chromosome, but pretty disadvantageous, as you can imagine, for the purple chromosome and for the rest of the genome because it just dropped 50% of its sperm count because of the selfish action of one chromosome. And so the rest of the genome is basically fighting back to try to suppress this behavior. And there's all kinds of such arms races going on, including decrepit arms races that we can uncover in our own genome uh, as well. But the one that I'm actually going to uh, sort of emphasize most, which is the most beautiful example of selfishness, is what occurs uh, in plants and animals in the process of female meiosis. And female meiosis is the process where, once again, you go through four products of meiosis, but only one of those products is going to be destined for evolutionary success by inclusion into the oocyte and into the next generation. So now you don't even have to invent an elaborate killing mechanism to get rid of the competition. In fact, 
Nature has already done that. All you need to do is win the race to end up in the winning position more often than not. And we think that this process actually takes advantage of centromeric DNA and proteins by orienting the selfish uh, centromere in the preferred location such that it ends up more often than not in the egg and therefore transmitted as a selfish gene. What's really interesting about this is that this is cheating that's occurring during chromosome segregation. And this means that there is an arms race going on between the essential components of our cell division apparatus, where the centromeric DNA is acting as the selfish rogue element, and the proteins are trying to suppress the selfishness, leading once again to the same kinds of episodes of adaptation and counteradaptation, like I showed you with antiviral proteins and viral proteins. So the signature of evolution actually tells us that something quite sinister is going on with uh, fundamental mechanisms of our genome. And because this is so fundamental uh, and so rapidly evolving, we think that these components fail to work with each other, so much so that they can lead to uh, incompatibilities even between recently diverged populations, as what you might have uh, seen when you cross a horse and a donkey, you get a mule. The mule is very hearty, but it's completely sterile because there's a fundamental mismatch between components of the cell division apparatus. So this is, of course, a really sort of pristine ground because Darwin himself could not really ask, answer the question about why is it that when you cross different species, you do not uh, in, get fertile, viable offspring in many cases. And the answer to some of these a mystery of mysteries might actually emerge from this dark matter of the genome, which is where the centromeres reside. Thank you very much.